All right. A very good morning to one and all. Um, thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. And thank you for the ongoing support for APEX 2020. I hope the symposium has been a, a great learning opportunity for all. And as we move on to this track, um, track 12, um, we are very excited to have a, 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 a list, a, a panel of um, esteemed foreign and local speakers. Um, who will share with us some of the experiences in preparing for the pandemic. So as you know, COVID-19 um, hit us hard um, from February and you know, by March it has become a pandemic. And a lot of us in various parts of the world find ourselves um, struggling and scrambling to prepare and our search capabilities to prepare our ICUs um, for, to, to cope with the rapid influx of patients um, who develop respiratory failure and require ICU level of care. Um, and you know, in the process, we have, we have had a lot of harrowing experiences in trying to upskill ourselves, the staff, equipment, and the physical capabilities. And some of us um, in various parts of the world also have to make difficult decisions trying to balance uh, and justify um, equitable resource allocation um, versus uh, balancing um, uh, limitations in uh, logistics, right? So, um, Track 12, um, entitled, Are ICUs Prepared for COVID-19? The Considerations. And um, like I said, we are excited to have this great lineup of speakers. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Adolfikov from Harvard Medical School of the United States. Um, Associate Professor Tan Hui Ling from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. And uh, Prof. Chris Nixon um, from Alfred ICU Australia. Um, for the participants, there's a Q&A tab um, on the Zoom screen. Um, so as and when you have questions, feel free to type it in the, in the Q&A tab and we will address the questions at the end of each um, individual talk. Um, okay, so without further ado, I would introduce our first speaker. <clears throat> Dr. Nicholas Sadovnikov is um, a critical care and anesthesia thoracic anesthesia faculty at the Brigham and Women's Hospital since 1998. And he is board certified in internal medicine, critical care medicine, and anesthesiology. And, is, and he is the co-director of the surgical intensive care units, as well as program director of the Brigham and Women's Hospital Fellowship in Anesthesiology and Critical Care. He was inducted as a fellow in the American College of Critical Care Medicine in 2008. And in 2008 to 2009, he completed his fellowship in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School. He currently serves as uh, the co-chair of the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital Ethics Committee and is an active member of the Ethics Consultation Service and has achieved certification in healthcare ethics uh, consultation. So, you know, he is the perfect person to talk to us about um, some of the uh, difficulties um, in, in um, prioritizing and uh, balancing the, the just allocation of ICU resources. So, um, Dr. Nicholas, um, air time over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, and you, uh, you, you, you refrained from mentioning that you once uh, served in that very fellowship, which I direct, which uh, uh, is uh, the reason for, I think, this uh, rich connection between Harvard and uh, Singapore for this, for this meeting. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, our experiences uh, last spring uh, in the context of uh, crisis standards of care. And this was kind of a bland topic that I didn't think people needed to pay that much attention to for a long period of my life. And then all of a sudden it became something which completely consumed every hour of every day of my life uh, when we suddenly realized in, in March of 2020 uh, that what was happening in Italy uh, was only a few weeks from uh, landing on our doorstep. So uh, I will start out by saying that I have no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. Few of us ethicists have found any industry support, quite frankly. Um, uh, the objectives of the talk would be to sort of understand what are the basic ethical principles uh, that we abide by in a crisis standards of care situation. Um, uh, and then to look at what, what are the challenges of prioritizing 
the distribution of limited resources if you can't get something, uh, uh, make something available to everybody. Uh, and then what are the obstacles to impl implementation of such a framework? And, and then a little bit of sharing of some of the controversies that we encountered as we went forward in an attempt to plan for this uh, uh, really devastating uh, notion that we actually wouldn't have enough ventilators or ICU beds. So just a quick sort of def definition of crisis standards of care. This comes from the National Academy of Medicine. It's a substantial change in usual healthcare operations and the level of care it is possible to deliver made necessary by a pervasive or catastrophic disaster. And it requires a shift from considering what is good for an individual patient to maximizing benefit for a population of patients. And this is this, this aspirational notion of achieving the greatest good for the greatest number. You will see, I think, along the way that, that this, this is, uh, while noble in terms of a, uh, a lofty aspirational goal, a bit more difficult once the details need to be sorted out. So uh, in our usual standards of care, uh, certainly typically in uh, the US, uh, we have a deep respect for patient autonomy. A physician is really duty bound to maximize the benefit to each patient and has his fidelity and allegiance to the individual patient. And as a result of that, not all who benefit, could benefit, uh, can receive treatment. Uh, and sometimes those who don't, it's because of a lack of access or, or insurance or, uh, or really uh, sufficient funds. Uh, in crisis standards of care, um, we shift to a respect for a common good as opposed to individual autonomy. And this, this may not be as foreign a concept to many of the uh, people in the audience as it is to Americans, but uh, the, the precious uh, adherence to autonomy needs to be uh, released in favor of uh, ideal, uh, maximizing the benefit to the greatest number of people. And, and along with this uh, is the requirement to allocate the resources that no longer can be applied to every patient responsibly and obviously not all who could benefit will receive treatment, uh, and in this case, due to scarcity. So when capacity gets challenged, there's sort of this um, gradient uh, that we talk about where you have conventional capacity where you can kind of make use of all the things that you have uh, and, and accommodate a, a small surge. And then you reach a contingency capacity where uh, disruption of ordinary use of practices is the case, uh, but you still are able to achieve functionally equivalent care. And then in crisis capacity, the disruption to standard of care is due to inadequate resources to meet the need of every uh, patient. But the goal is sufficiency of care, that is to provide the best possible care given the circumstances. And this is a little graphic that sort of uh, um, illustrates uh, this concept of a conventional response, a 20% increase in capacity, and a contingency response where you see the number of stick figures here is increasing and the amount of resources available uh, proportionally is decreasing, and then a crisis situation. And as you uh, move up this uh, gradient, you go from conserving and substituting to adapting and reusing things that you would normally discard. Uh, and then finally to not only adapting and reusing, but reallocating and, and, and eventually triaging. <clears throat> there are a number of overarching sort of uh, ethical principles to keep in mind, but I've bolded the word fairness here because that is the word that we uh, attempt to give the greatest priority to, and you see that's different from the usual bolded word of autonomy. Now we're talking about fairness and a fairness in the distribution of these limited resources. But in that context, we also have a duty to care for every patient, a duty to steward our resources responsibility, responsibly, a, uh, a duty to be transparent and, uh, and, and publicly uh, clear about what our policies are and how they will be uh, carried out, 
uh, a duty to be consistent in that carrying out and not make exceptions. And then uh, duty to a proportionality and accountability in the in the distribution of care and and then uh, the willingness to take account or responsibility for what has uh, been uh, implemented. So there are many different ways that we can decide to treat. Uh, some patients and not others when we can't treat everyone. And nobody knows the exact right calculus here, uh, but many of the uh, paradigms are listed here. Uh, priority to the sickest, uh, the most needy therefore for care. Uh, should it be first come first served? Is that fair? A lottery seems to be very fair, except that it also seems to be quite random and perhaps subject to uh, biases. Uh, priority to the likeliest to benefit, uh, maybe not the thickest, but those who are uh, younger or at baseline healthier and therefore if treated will be the most likely to recover to their previous baseline. Uh, priority to the youngest uh, in a sort of fair innings argument that someone who's older has had more of a shot at life than a younger person. Um, how about instrumental value, the priority given to those who have a most useful role in society? Uh, needless to say, that could be somewhat difficult to characterize fully. Uh, and should, should healthcare providers uh, receive priority in care compared to other people uh, presenting with the same degree of illness. Uh, so MGB, I put an asterisk here because uh, for uh, several decades, the uh, coalition of hospitals headed by um, Brigham and Women's and Mass General Hospital has been known as Partners Healthcare. And it has recently been rebranded as Mass General Brigham uh, Healthcare. And uh, presumably because the names are uh, more um, uh, uh, recognizable than partners. Uh, uh, and then um, we, uh, just to make it clear, the goal was to have a process that would apply to all the Mass General Brigham Hospital network. And this is about 10 hospitals in the, uh, Boston, Western Massachusetts, actually Martha's Vineyard. So uh, a number of different hospitals of varying levels of cap capability. And we were trying to sort of figure out what is the, you know, a policy that can be applied both in smaller hospitals and in the larger medical centers, the referral centers. And uh, so it was already a bit of a challenge. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Massachusetts had not identified uh, guidelines for such a process for the hospitals and for the healthcare system. However, there were a number of states which had uh, designed policies, including New York, Maryland, Minnesota, Colorado, Pennsylvania. And we looked at theirs and tried to create, not reinvent the wheel, but create a, um, a method for uh, triaging that would be in parallel with, uh, or would be at least informed by uh, other institutions and state um, um, policies. So um, most of these follow the same pattern of using two uh, elements, uh, or at least one of these two elements, to prioritize patients. And one was an acute illness state. And almost all these policies used a SOFA score for that, a sequential organ failure assessment score. Uh, on the pretense that uh, the patients with the lowest SOFA scores would be the most likely to survive. And so those uh, presenting with the disease in question uh, with the lowest SOFA score would get priority. The, the principle being to save the most lives. But on top of that, uh, the um, points were given in the uh, scoring system uh, for chronic disease burden. Uh, and you can see that being assigned points is a bad thing in a priority score. So uh, those who had a, a chronic disease burden that led to 
uh, a expected shortened lifespan in the absence of this uh, infection uh, would receive lower priority on the principle of saving the most life years, therefore saving the lives of those who didn't have underlying comorbidities and would stand to live many, many more years once they uh, recover from this uh, illness. And so the priority score, I'll show you the, uh, the rubric in just one second, could range from one to eight. And so you can see that um, the point system was such that a SOFA score of less than six was assigned one point, between six and nine, two points, 10 to 12, three points, and greater than 12, four points. And then anyone with major comorbid conditions with substantial impact on long-term survival would be assigned two points, and anyone with severe comorbid conditions expected to die with one year, within one year would be assigned four points. So the persons with the lowest cumulative score would be given the highest priority to receive critical care services. Uh, there were some additional uh, scoring considerations. Uh, patients who happen to be pregnant, uh, but uh, at the point past, uh, past which fetal viability could be expected, got a two-point deduction on the pretext that those were two relatively young lives at stake. And then there was this notion of tiebreakers, which was first to go to the youngest patients, so-called life cycle considerations, and then uh, to individuals who performed, performed tasks that are vital to the public health response. Uh, and then if still tied, uh, go to a lottery. And then there is a triage review and oversight committee, which I'll show you a little bit more about in just a few seconds. So um, this is how people would fall in. Uh, the highest priority patients would have scores of one to two, uh, the lowest of six to eight, and patients who didn't really need uh, critical care resources were classified as green, and they would be eliminated from the algorithm. I won't belabor this, uh, this lengthy uh, flow diagram, other than to point out that at the very top, the folks who didn't need anything, uh, critical care resources were eliminated from the algorithm. Those who were, uh, on the brink of dying were not uh, felt to be uh, appropriate to enter in the algorithm and they would be immediately shifted over to symptom management and psychosocial support. In, in other words, mostly comfort-based uh, care as opposed to secure-based care. And then the rest would be prioritized according to their score and given critical care resources depending on the availability. So there might be one day when oranges would make it in and another day when there were so few beds that only reds would make it in. And there might be some days when only patients with a score of one or two within the red might make it in. So um, this was the notion and then an even more exotic flow diagram was designed. I won't uh, belabor this other than to go into the center point here and identify that what we did was we wanted to make sure that the physician at the bedside of the patient wasn't responsible for deciding if his, his or her individual patient needed to, or was deserving of a, a critical care, a scarce critical care resource. So that responsibility was shifted to this central individual who was a triage officer. The triage officer was backed up by a triage team, uh, which, uh, it consisted of administrative help, a nurse, and then uh, ex uh, content experts. And then um, there was also the triage officer would be aware of what the resources were at any given time. The triage officer would be given the information about the patient's comorbidities and the SOFA score and uh, would uh, make a decision as to whether an individual patient would be awarded or uh, assigned uh, critical care resources. This was um, uh, a uh, very clear effort to remove the responsibility and the psychological burden of the bedside physician of having to decide whether their patient warranted critical care resources or not, uh, and to make it a more uh, dispassionate, removed process. Um, and then just I'm moving to the bottom of, the, um, of this large diagram here. Um, and, and magnifying what happens here is the uh, high, medium, and low priority 
a uh, patient can get critical care uh, in the order of their uh, score. And if they don't, then they are also, similarly to those who are imminently dying, uh, shifted up to uh, a decreased level of care. And um, just to show you one more, th that is this corner I just showed you, and then this final corner here, uh, where we actually continually reassess patients once they've been assigned to critical care. And if they uh, get worse and their score worsens, or if resources become scarcer, such that their score no longer qual qualifies, they also have the uh, risk, run the risk of being uh, shifted into symptom management as opposed to pure based intensive care. So you can imagine that this is not the most uh, easy thing to uh, implement. And the good news is we didn't get there. The bad news is that we did uh, multiple tabletop simulations uh, with all of the uh, representative members of these uh, roles, triage officers, bedside physicians, um, triage team, etc. And um, it exposed some really concerning challenges to implementation. Furthermore, once we uh, publicized this plan, uh, and we did this in a series of webinars over an entire weekend, eight webinars to the entire uh, staff of the hospital, um, department by department, uh, we started to get a fair amount of uh, criticism regarding uh, how fair this, this system actually was, even though it was designed to be as fair and um, uh, bias-free as possible. So first of all, there's a problem with SOFA scoring, um, and we all recognize this. SOFA scoring is really um, uh, here was designed to try to figure out who the sickest patients were and who were the least or and who were the least sick and could be most likely to survive. But it's really best validated as an acuity scoring system. And it's not really designed for studying individual patients or for making individual prognostications on patients and being used as some sort of um, razor to decide uh, who does and doesn't get uh, uh, resources. And then each individual element of the SOFA score raised concerns. Um, uh, there are, as you probably know, uh, six elements. Um, uh, this is the SOFA score, uh, uh, six elements including the P to F ratio, platelets, bilirubin, presence of hypotension, presence of severity, Glasgow coma scale, and creatinine. Um, the P to F ratio, uh, well, that's easy enough if you have a uh, blood gas measurement and a closed respiratory circuit, so you can precisely measure the PaO2 and FiO2, but uh, many of our patients certainly didn't have one, if not neither of those. So uh, it was proposed that, well, maybe we can impute the PO2 from the SAT and we could impute the FiO2 from whatever the supplemental oxygen delivery system was, but this had its clear limitations. Uh, as PEEP responsive as this disease was, should this P to F ratio be on optimized PEEP or is it just before the patient has uh, mechanical ventilation? So this, this was very vexing to figure out how this should be implemented. Uh, the platelets uh, was concerning because uh, people do live very productive lives for decades with chronically low platelets and yet this seemed to uh, apply quite a penalty to them. Uh, and, and, you know, you would get a point for a platelet count of 99, uh, but not of 101. So uh, people were very concerned that it was quite arbitrary and capricious. Similarly, um, bilirubins uh, uh, as a measure of uh, acute illness, very little uh, COVID-19 liver disease uh, to speak of. So uh, I wasn't really, sh no one was sure how that really played in. And then the hypotension assessment, uh, unusual set of drugs that were chosen, um, dopamine, uh, for some reason, dobutamine is listed as a guess oppressor. Um, and then um, uh, various doses of dopamine and epi, uh, but no mention of vasopressin or uh, phenylephrine, uh, which are commonly used also to combat hypotension. So, um, this was also a concern. Um, and then uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale is obviously subjective. The verbal response can't really be assessed uh, with an endotracheal tube in place. People were thinking that 
Uh, the best you could do was to figure out what the GCS would be if the patient didn't have a breathing tube in. Uh, and that seemed awfully arbitrary and subjective. And then the creatinine cutoff of 1.2 before you started getting penalty points in a sofa seemed somewhat low, especially in some of our uh, African-American patients. And then a, a, you know, a, a dialyzed patient uh, on CVVH could actually have a normal looking creatinine in spite of being uh, aneuric and having a GFR of zero. So there were great concerns about the validity of using the SOFA score in the context of this uh, epidemic. And in fact, most of the patients uh, were presenting with single organ failure. They basically had respiratory failure and most of them did not have other coexisting diseases. So most of them had a SOFA score of less than six. So it really wasn't that discriminatory at all uh, in this particular population. And I didn't, uh, I didn't put up a slide about it, but there was a, a paper out of China that suggested actually Apache 2 scoring uh, had a little bit better prognostic uh, relevance compared to SOFA scoring in COVID patients. But this was the SOFA score which had been chosen by all these other uh, entities uh, as their means for assessing acute illness. So that's what we had gone with. Um, and then so uh, you can see the priority scoring. Uh, if most people had a SOFA score of less than six, then it fell to their, their major comorbidities. And that, that was um, major and severe comorbidities, I should say. And that was a great uh, concern as well. So there were exceedingly few patients, as I say, with SOFA scores, even in the six to nine range, and almost none in this uh, three and four point uh, SOFA score range. So most patients ended up with a priority score of one or sometimes three, or if they were really, and again, it turned out there weren't that many patients who were expected to die within a year either. There were some, but not as many as we would have imagined. So um, it wasn't clear to this, this, this um, score was uh, performing the job we were hoping it was going to perform. And this was just in simulation. And then looking at the patient population that eventually came through. So um, then this comorbidities issue was intended to take into account the principle of maximizing life years, life years uh, that someone who has a major comorbidity burden is not expected to live that long. But um, while we could reach some consensus on who was expected to live less than a year, there was really no consensus in the end on what major comorbid comorbid Conditions with substantial impact and long survival consistent. Is five years the right sort of expectation? And if so, boy, a lot can change in five years, right, in terms of uh, advances in treatment of a given condition or a, a, a given pandemic, for instance. So uh, we don't, um, we, we weren't able to really wrap our hands around that. And then, really, um, what was very alarming and caused some serious self reflection was. Uh, the population, uh, the comorbidities uh, were clearly more prevalent in populations that already uh, were suffering, uh, particularly in our country, from structural socioeconomic disadvantages, and that thereby uh, they were entering this algorithm already burdened with a higher degree of comorbidities, and then this, this algorithm then disadvantaged them further. Uh, and this created a significant outcry from um, equity stakeholders from communities of color and the disability community who felt that they would be unfairly um, disadvantaged in this algorithm. Folks who were homeless and impoverished and had less access or means to access the uh, medical system, et cetera. Uh, so the question of fairness was really uh, at stake here and I think uh, justifiably so. And I think it's worth, um, yeah, it's worth mentioning that this is, um, this is uh, when we looked at ourselves and looked around the room at all the people who are making these policies, we did not see representation from communities of color or the disability community. And the same thing happened at the state level as well. They looked around at their own committee after they got done with this same process, which was almost exactly in parallel uh, in the months of March and April and realized they didn't have anyone at the table who came from disadvantaged communities of any kind. Um, so uh, the, the, 
the negative feedback on that was quite powerful and uh, I think justified. Um, and then what about uh, favoring healthcare providers? Uh, Dr. Jill Emanuel and nine other authors uh, published a New England Journal opinion piece at the end of March saying, uh, critical interventions, testing, PPE, ICU beds, ventilators, et cetera, should go first to frontline healthcare workers and others who care for ill patients and who keep critical infrastructure operating, particularly workers who face a high risk of infection and whose training makes them difficult to replace. So this was, um, this was uh, something of a surprise to us from an ethical standpoint. Um, because well, we could we could see the argument that um, uh, healthcare providers had a certain instrumental value. If they became ill, it negatively would affect the care of all the other patients if they were no longer able to care for patients. And furthermore, there was some sense that there ought to be a quid pro quo for people willing to go out and expose themselves to the risk of infection on the front line um, and be. Um, you know, uh, therefore treated uh, in some favor should they uh, contract the disease. Uh, however, in opposition to those concerns was again, us looking at ourselves, ourselves and realizing, um, you know, were we writing a policy that would benefit policymakers uh, already being a relatively privileged population? And then, in fact, not all healthcare workers who are going to be privileged by this actually work on the front lines. Some stay home. Are we going to have some litmus test as to who has and hasn't been working on the front lines? Um, and then uh, there'd be difficult uh, to define who really counts as a contributor to the healthcare response in the pandemic, because there's many paramedical and non-medical personnel who are exposed, perhaps even more so than those of us in the hospital who have the best PPEs who have the most testing for our patients, the ambulance personnel who are going out in the community and transporting people to the hospital are probably at much greater risk than the people who are actually receiving them in the ICU. And they are absolutely essential. And yet, they didn't seem to fall within this rubric, or if they did, then we need to also bring you know, uh, the Uber drivers who are getting people to work on, the people who are stocking the shelves in the supermarket to make sure we all had to go get something to eat and so forth. So it seems very cumbersome to oper operationalize this favor, uh, favoring the benefit to healthcare providers. So I'm happy to report that, um, that since then, uh, we've sort of grappled with all of these things. And the state recently issued new guidelines for which the pub public comment period just ended. Uh, and they wisely uh, brought uh, several uh, equity stakeholders, including members from minority and disability communities onto their uh, policymaking committee. They still uh, are using the SOFA score, but they've made some modifications for chronic kidney disease patients. They've made some accommodations for patients with disabilities. Uh, they've discarded altogether the sort of moderate health care or the, the five-year survival health care uh, expect or health ex, uh, life expectation concern and they only uh, still apply the four points to the um, people who are expected to only live uh, a year or less and um, and then this uh, advantage for health care workers has has vanished from the guidelines as have the has the whole concept of tiebreakers uh, because in fact you're almost never uh, sitting with two patients uh, competing for one bed. Patients come in sequentially, not simultaneously. And so usually you've made a decision and then someone comes in who may be more uh, deserving perhaps, but you've already committed the bed to someone. And once you've committed a bed, you give them at least a trial of critical care. And that, that language has also been baked into the new uh, guidelines. So at this point, Mass General Brigham is, is awaiting the final state guidance uh, to finalize our institutional document. So uh, I hope that um, uh, all of you uh, uh, can appreciate that maybe there is um, some rainbow of hope uh, in all of this.
And I, I hope that none of you uh, actually are confronted with ever having to implement, and I hope we don't either have to implement crisis standards of care. But I thought it was an exercise that was worth sharing and, um, and worth uh, putting in everyone's mind as something that we might have to uh, eventually engage in at some point in our career. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sadovnikov, for the very uh, insightful uh, breakdown of the process and coming up with this multidimensional scoring system um, to guide uh, logistics um, to resource allocation. So um, there's one question in the Q&A panel um, asking for your comment on the following statement. Generally, a healthcare worker who needs intubation for COVID might never go back to the front line as a result of emotional trauma and chronic post-critical Ill critical illness problems. Um, uh, do you have any comments on this or do you have any personal um, experience with uh, a fellow healthcare worker getting uh, inflicted with COVID and um, having difficulties returning to the front line? So, um, uh, as you may or may not know, one of your co-fellows actually contracted the illness but did not require hospitalization. Um, but, uh, and so we don't have that experience. However, we did say, as we talked about this, that if we were gonna talk about instrumental value of healthcare workers, or particularly physicians and nurses who would get sick, their allotment of preference would be not to come back and get back to work on this pandemic, but to be recovered well enough to respond to the next pandemic. So, um, and in that regard, certainly there, there is a value to, uh, to trying to um, optimize their uh, well-being. But again, it's, it's a complicated matrix when you start um, um, taking, taking care of your own a little bit more than, um, than other members of the population. And um, another question, you know, some authors or some um, guidelines have suggested the use of some clinical frailty assessment scores as part of the assessment of whether, you know, the patient is likely to develop a long-term disability or, or is likely to benefit from um, ICU level of care. I'm just wondering in, in, in Brigham, was the clinical frailty scoring or uh, frailty assessment part of this whole matrix? Yeah, I can. I, I know exactly where the influence is coming here, and um, I actually uh, advocated strongly that we ought to uh, include some sort of basic frailty. numerical or chronological age, because as we know, um, age is not nearly as good a predictor of outcomes as frailty. So uh, I agree 100%. Uh, however, um, my concerns were not necessarily met with uh, incorporation into the next set of policies. Although we're doing a lot of work in our research group on frailty and in other populations, surgical populations, emergency surgery populations, and so forth. And I think that eventually this concept will need to be rolled into our, um, our basic fundamental guidelines for triaging patients if we have uh, shortages of uh, resources because frailty probably predicts much better than most other uh, sort of uh, bland metrics uh, uh, as to how a patient is going to, how likely a patient is going to recover. All right. <clears throat> so um, thank you once again, Dr. Sadovnikov. And um, you know, I, I been uh, trying to refrain myself from saying that I, I did the best uh, critical care fellowship in Brigham last year and you know thank you for uh, making sure I came back to Singapore safely. Thank you. So um, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Sadovnikov again um, and uh, we shall move on to the second talk of the track. So next up we have uh, Associate Professor um, Tan Hui Ling. Uh, she is an anesthesiologist and intensivist trained in Singapore UK and Australia. She is a senior consultant in the Department of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care and Pain Medicine in Tan Tock Seng Hospital, Singapore. Um, she's currently the chair of the ICU committee and the assistant chairman medical board for clinical quality and audit. As part of the team for the design and build of the ICU in the National Center for Infectious Disease, she has been involved with ICU planning for pandemics 
in the last 10 years. And she, she is the perfect person to, to, to deliver the next lecture entitled um, The Scramble to Prepare for COVID-19, the, the, the ins and outs. So um, without further ado, um, Prof Tan, over to you. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, greetings from Singapore. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to join this webinar. And uh, it's a pleasure to share our experience at Tan Tok Seng Hospital and the National Center for Infectious Diseases. A lot of our attitude towards outbreak um, was due to the, the trauma that we had when uh, SARS happened in 2003. Um, a few very well-loved uh, staff at our hospital lost their lives. And this really brought home the message that staff safety and staff morale uh, have to be guarded at all costs. We also witnessed the negative psychological consequences when patients and families are isolated because of the infectious nature of the disease. And that made us realize that we had, we had nothing to, to look after uh, this very big uh, psychological need. The ICU is just a part of the hospital meso system, which is then a part of the wider healthcare system, the whole macro system. So preparation has to happen at the unit level, the hospital level, and at the national level, and all three layers need to be coordinated for a good and effective response. Singapore's international connectivity made it such that um, our attitude towards the next outbreak is, is one of when it would occur and not whether it would occur. So we wanted to have a high degree of confidence that whatever plan we put in place would, would really work. And we kind of tweaked and tweaked the plan uh, every time we had a different pathogen to, to deal with going from H1N1 to MERS to Ebola. And eventually we decided that um, for our tabletop, we actually, call, we actually had to call it pathogen X so that we could put in uh, some element of preparing for the unknown uh, into our mindset. So when we first heard that uh, these cases were happening in Wuhan, we started to put our plan in motion and uh, looking back, it, it was uh, in the most unusual Chinese New Year because so many of us were at the hospital uh, working out the details of the plans and coordinating with each other instead of celebrating with the family. And we were glad that we kind of sacrificed our Chinese New Year to, to work instead of putting it off because within a few days, we, we had two patients in the ICU at the same time and one of whom was a tourist from China. So that kind of kicked off um, the local community spread and ICU became really busy because these were the middle age patients with all the comorbidities and, and all the high risk. Unfortunately, uh, despite all the efforts, um, we, we had two deaths uh, in our unit on, on the same day as well. So um, that, that was really sobering. And then two days after that on the 23rd of March, was what is known to us at Tan Tok Seng as the most horrible Monday, because that was the day that screening centers saw 520 patients, a huge explosion. Uh, the, the tiny screening center could take 50 people and now we have 500 to the day. So again, it was in the nick of time that we had worked with ministry to erect this tentage along the whole uh, car park that was along the whole side of the building and patients were there till about 3 a.m. before they could be screened and um, uh, decisions could be made on, on what they would, where they would go. So that kind of signaled the beginning of the huge surge that occurred in the foreign worker dormitories. And then the circuit breaker was uh, put in place and then the cases very, very, very gradually uh, dropped. And by September, we had screened about 35,000 patients, uh, warded about 4,000 patients. And at the national level, we had about a, 100 patients in the ICUs who were intubated. And obviously there were some who were not intubated. And for these 100 confirmed cases, there were a lot more uh, suspects that had to be uh, ruled out and then moved on to the non-COVID ICUs. So this graph shows um, kind of, 
the huge explosion that, that happened in Singapore. And because the explosion was so huge, we, we felt that we really needed to, to prepare for a real crisis because at that point, uh, there was no absolutely no certainty as to how effective these public health measures would be and how many ICU patients we would eventually have to see. So fortunately, fortunately, the ICUs have been relatively spared. And as you can see from this next chart, um, the majority of the patients were in the foreign worker dormitories. And thankfully, um, the majority of them were young and uh, because of um, very close monitoring and escalation when any of them turned ill. In the end, the, the entire ICU system was not totally flooded. And the blue blocks that represented the community spread uh, sort of was kept uh, at a low uh, number. So, so our ICU capacity um, at the first phase of uh, search capacity uh, was quite able to handle and all the drawer plans for search two, search three, all the way up to search six were, were kind of um, advanced planning that we uh, put in place. So with that as the backdrop, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what it was really like uh, at NCID because following SARS, we, we had 10 years worth of meetings and, and certainly uh, many more when, when this building was being constructed. And a lot of, um, uh, we benefited from learning from many overseas centers through, through their generous uh, sharing. And in particular, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Emory as well as Nebraska. So at the Novena Health Campus, the main hospital is Tan Tok Seng Hospital, which has 1,500 beds. It's a busy tertiary hospital with, uh, at peacetime, we have six different critical care locations. Uh, we operate 51 ICU beds and about 62 high dependency beds. Across the road is um, the new uh, NCID. It's a purpose-built uh, facility for outbreaks for, for which uh, there are 30, 330 uh, beds. There's a screening center, there's a laboratory, there's radiology with CT scan. And on hindsight, uh, we are so pleased that we managed to push that through because at design phase, uh, there were a lot of questions on, uh, it is so expensive to have a dedicated standalone CT facility. Uh, is it really necessary to build it? So we were so glad that we, we built this because as everyone knows for the COVID patients, CT scan was just quite a important component of knowing how to look after these patients. So in NCID, there are two ICU wards uh, making a total of 38 bits. So all we can say is that we are so, so, so relieved that when COVID happened, NCID was already up and running. So in order to have good connectivity across the, the, all the buildings, um, there were a couple of uh, uh, link bridges built. The one indicated by the red arrow is the main thoroughfare actually, and that's a true level link bridge that connects um, the main hospital building to NCID. So patients would go along um, level three and uh, staff would go along level two. The other bridge, which is indicated by the yellow arrow is the bridge that connects the staff officers to the training block. And the training block is then connected to NCID again at two levels. So this then made it easy for staff to go back and forth. For visitors, uh, there's a separate uh, underpass that is built at uh, basement one and visitors can also go across at the road level. So this made it a lot easier when we had to, to do the identification and the tracking and, and manage uh, inadvertent stuff to patient, stuff to visitor, visitor to visitor, uh, all the various uh, permutations of uh, spread. Within the ICU, um, because it was a purpose-built building, um, the government had definitely uh, balanced the investment in terms of how much do we bill and how much do we uh, not bill because none of us wanted a, a huge white elephant. So when we built the two ICUs, in order to have some sort of financial um, viability, one of the ICUs, which is next to the operating theater was actually operating as a day surgery unit. And that sort of gave us the flexibility to sort of close it down uh, whenever we uh, wanted to prepare for an outbreak. So each of the rooms, uh, are all, they're all single rooms with negative pressure and they all have anti-rooms. The, there's a 
PPE station at the at the door of all these uh, rooms to make it really easy for staff to uh, don. And we also wanted to reduce the number of preventable uh, staff entries um, to reduce staff exposure to any um, contagious pathogen. So uh, lots of uh, monitoring were brought outside the room and uh, we had uh, medical device connectivity so that we could actually look at um, what's happening uh, on the ventilator screens just by clicking on the monitors outside. The next picture shows the double doors to the patient rooms, which are interlocking. And the part that I'd like to bring everyone's attention to is where the yellow arrow is pointing. So that was what, that's what we call the pasture hatch. And uh, initially we all thought that was a bit of uh, a, a good to have, uh, a bit of an excess. But during the outbreak, it turned out to be so essential because staff were able to pass things into the room without having to change into the PPE. And that sort of had a lot of uh, PPE conservation. It also then reduced the need for staff in the room to come out to get staff. And, and so this interlocking uh, pass through the, this pass through hatch with an interlocking door became uh, something that was kind of a bit of a lifesaver. Within the ICU room, we really struggled because we are smack in the middle of, uh, of prime uh, property area. So, so actually, um, although this room is slightly bigger than our main hospital, it really is far smaller than uh, the new hospitals that were built uh, up north uh, uh, in the island we had to just work with whatever space we could. So um, the PPE for doffing uh, that station was then uh, set out in, in this uh, corner at the site. And then there was a huge debate on, uh, should we put a CCTV, should we not put a CCTV? In the end, um, we felt that uh, for staff safety, uh, having that CCTV is helpful because we could then directly observe and monitor and then that resulted in either a buddy system that could put in place to guide staff in the doffing, or we could then use it as uh, uh, monitoring to point out uh, blind spots. And the same thing is uh, again set up in the anteroom. room Out in the main uh, ICU, uh, because we were also preparing for kind of a crisis if, if our nursing ratio had, had to come down, uh, from one nurse to one patient to maybe one nurse to two or even worse, three patients, then I think a central monitoring hub as well as communication hub would be quite important uh, for patient safety. During all our drills, we realized that communication aids was so important. Initially, we thought that intercom was good. And then later we realized that actually voice transmission was a problem, particularly if we are wearing the N95 and things were even worse with uh, PAPR. And then we realized that for patients and families, the, the ability to talk to each other in, in a kind of like a comfortable, familiar way was important. And, and in the end, when our visitors came to the ICU, they were actually using the telephone uh, to talk to their loved ones uh, in the ICU. And that, that kind of, um, we could saw visibly uh, on the faces of our visitors that after that, that phone call, they, they all felt uh, a whole lot better and, and uh, more at peace. In terms of practical utility, it was actually the plain old uh, white board with a marker pen uh, that we used the most, especially when we were doing all the difficult procedures and looking after the difficult patients. So despite all this level of preparedness when, when the outbreak opened, um, operationally there was actually um, a, a whole slew of stuff that, that we had to do because um, we, we certainly couldn't uh, keep the number of scrubs uh, within uh, the change rooms that we needed. By the time uh, we were running 30 bits as compared to peacetime where we already were running 10 bits because we didn't want to work in an ICU for the first time in an outbreak. So painfully, we actually shifted some of the business as usual medical ICU work to uh, 3E so that at least we could know which tabs were not working, uh, which... Um, monitors or which PowerPoints were not working and we could get those fixed before any major outbreak. The next thing then was catering for the staff because staff could not go to the cafeteria. Uh, food, was, food had to be to ordered in. And lockers were something we kind of expected because there was no way, um, given the footprint that the building had to sit on, 
uh, and, and the overall price of the entire building, which is already the most expensive healthcare building in Singapore, uh, there was no way we could have uh, so much space. So in the end, uh, we put in lockers that had built-in combination locks so that it became easy for us to switch from personal lockers to shared lockers for temporary use. So obviously, um, similar to the rest of the world, there was this huge uh, scramble to, to stockpile consumables and then uh, nursing officers highlighted that, you know, they didn't even have space to keep some of this stuff that uh, we were trying to hoard. So we had to convert uh, training classrooms into uh, storage areas. When it comes to manpower, I think um, that there's no perfect way to plan for manpower. And at the end of the day, uh, while people say that manpower is a resource, it actually is a constraint because the number of people we have is finite. Uh, especially in tiny little Singapore. Unlike the US, we couldn't call for people from another state to come help, it, it's just us. Um, so firstly, we realized that with PPE, everything just takes so much longer. And staff also needed that mental space and energy for vigilance in, in order to stay safe, especially during the doffing. And, and we all experienced that um, inner tension when we were you know, calmly putting on our PPE uh, during the drill when the patient had already collapsed. Uh, we also had to be prepared to switch our mindset to that of crisis critical care norms if really uh, the worst case scenario uh, struck us. So we had this plan that we would actually have more generous staffing when uh, we opened the outbreak ICU, when we had the manpower, so that staff would feel reassured so that they wouldn't have to rush. So instead of having to look after 10 patients, actually one team would probably only look after eight or even six if we could afford it at the beginning of the outbreak so that everyone could, could build that familiarity and build that confidence. But if we went into critical care norms, then we, we really would have to get everybody ready to, to accept a different kind of standards where we're just doing the best uh, under these difficult circumstances. The next big thing then was this... Um, Think about how we would reduce staff to staff transmission because obviously that has implications for staff safety and patient care. So I'll just highlight a couple of important strategies. Um, I think the one thing that the junior doctors repeatedly uh, told us was that they were just so reassured that there was a consultant on site day and night, regardless of uh, weekdays or, or weekends. And this also gave us at the leadership a degree of um, confidence that if, if something unexpected were to happen at 3 a.m., there was a consultant on site that, that could look after the whole crew, look after the patient and, and make sure everyone was safe. So I really described a little bit about the flexible manning uh, with terms of manpower. We also had flexible manning in terms of uh, patient load because uh, we were staring at projection tables and ICU uh, modeling uh, tables in terms of how many beds you would need at which phase of the outbreak, but these are never precise. So we needed something operationally flexible. And uh, one of the consultants had a good idea that we need to be prepared to operate on norms. So if we had one ICU bed at 3 a.m. and we needed two patients to come in, we could convert it to kind of like a two uh, high dependency bed equivalent. And, and that kind of gave us that flexibility to conserve resources because we couldn't be putting so many nurses on shift when there were actually no patients. We're just basically tiring them out. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to have access to a large pool of manpower. The whole division of medicine supported uh, the ICUs, the entire division of surgery supported screening center. And uh, we also had this huge uh, program that uh, upskilled nurses from general wards and high dependency units to, to kind of bring them after training into the ICU for acclimatization so that if we really went into a search situation and had to look after 200 ICU patients, then, then people would already have had time and, and hopefully that would uh, contribute to better patient outcomes. The one thing that was uh, totally unexpected to us was that uh, we had to sort out uh, so many uh, detailed rules on how the tea room could be used. And at one point uh, when we had a staff who had to be quarantined because her brother was infected, uh, the, the director of nursing had a very draconian rule that uh, only three people could be in the tea room and only one staff in the tea room could have masks down in order to eat and the other two had to watch uh, one person could eat at any one time. So these were the kind of things that we ended up uh, doing uh, just so that uh, we tried our best to protect everyone. 
So uh, next speaker will talk a little bit more about training. Uh, so I just like to point out that training will always be a scramble because during peacetime, you know, it's just going to be so difficult to get people released from the various departments uh, because of service pressure in order to do this training when, when there's no threat of any outbreak on the horizon. So we quickly realized that we needed some sort of a baseline training and we needed a mechanism that could put in place just in time rate training when there is a real threat of the outbreak. So um, just as the Wuhan cases were happening, we put the just in time stuff into action. Uh, we noticed that PPE needed a whole session by itself just so that people could focus. And what the junior staff found, even the senior staff found really useful at the end uh, was this thing that we invented uh, on the fly called the ICU launch pad. Uh, which is in situ simulation training. So as 3E were looking after the real patients, uh, the training crew uh, set up 3F uh, to, to do simulation drills for the particularly um, dicey parts like intubations, like patient transfers, and, and staff found that this gave them the technical and psychological preparedness that they need. Obviously, infection control was hovering around uh, to make sure that they could catch uh, any of the blind spots to, to just point out for everyone uh, to learn. The hospital for uh, promoting psychological resilience actually uh, ran a, a social campaign. Um, we, we had already a Facebook, uh, a corporate version of Facebook called uh, Workplace, and they ran a social campaign capitalizing on that where staff could post positive messages. And I think this was quite helpful because it sort of undergird all the stress and the chaos and the anxiety with this tone of uh, positive things that were happening all around where people would share that, uh, oh, this doctor has bought lunch for the whole unit, you know, that they saw another nurse helping a patient. So there was this pulse of uh, sanity, uh, of human kindness, and also of human courage uh, that sort of kept us all sane. And as you can see from the pictures, being Singaporeans, food was a whole uh, huge important component of how we stayed sane. Structure is important when there's chaos. So uh, we never went to so many meetings in our lives. And at every meeting, uh, we were discussing issues that had no right and no wrong answers. So I think what's important is that ICU had a voice at the table. So I attended um, the meetings with senior management every day and and in order to help them understand as the ICU situation evolved, initially when we only had like maybe four or five ICU patients, I was actually sharing uh, the clinical conditions of each of these patients and what the staff had to go through um, initially, like when the first stroke patient came with query COVID, how we had to even bring, we had to figure out uh, ahead of time and then put in practice how we brought such a patient to scan and then uh, how this patient would go for a thrombectomy and would the patient go to the operating theater if there was a huge bleed? So, so management became very savvy because we, we told them through patient stories of the kind of uh, uh, things that we really needed to do in order to deliver good care. The ICU committee continued to look after the ICU operational and clinical matters. Um, after realizing that there were so many interdependencies, the outbreak ICU task force was convened. And then when we realized that if we really were up at search plan six, we were going to run 200 bits across eight different locations. So learning from the Italian literature, we, we had to uh, set up an ICU headquarter. And as the first speaker alluded to, uh, if, if needed, the, the people staffing the headquarter would then take over the ICU triage as well. So there was a mad scramble to write protocols. Um, the thing I'd like to highlight here is, is something that we never thought of during preparation. And that was the infodemic. You know, every day there was so, like you could be on 10 WhatsApp chats and, and everything was just buzzing. So at the end, um, the very real concern was highlighted that the important messages could be missed uh, in, in the flurry of uh, um, the WhatsApp chats. So we realized that we had to curate, or we had to designate certain um, chats for certain things so that people had to be disciplined about which chat they were using, uh, depending on what was the issue that they wanted to raise. And in order to cope with the rapid changes of, uh, in the protocols, because ED had like version 65 
of what they were going to do at screening centre because the definition of a case kept changing. So we had clear ownership, we had versioning and, and, and kind of like two months into the outbreak, we were all going nuts and we realised that we needed to put one person in charge of collecting all the important protocols and put it at one place on the intranet. So care is multidisciplinary in the ICU. And at this point, I think I'd just like to highlight that it is important to invest during peacetime what we want in the outbreak. So our 10 years of investment in, in building the multidisciplinary uh, connections for care uh, paid dividends because um, everybody was just so used to having an ID physician in the, in the, in, in the ICU when we were running daily ID rounds. Uh, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to be deciding on whether this patient got remdesivir by myself. So it was hugely uh, reassuring in the ICU to, to, have the ICU, uh, to have the ID consultant. And then when it came to managing difficult patient uh, care decisions, um, we brought the weekly PAL rounds to, to twice weekly. And then we realized that in order to protect staff from uh, unnecessary exposure, the rehab group got shifted to uh, looking after the patients after they left the main ICU to sort of catch up with the rehab. Then we had to look after the surgeons, the cardiologists, because as we all know, COVID patients have COVID and it is never COVID alone. So at the national level, um, obviously, we needed to have coordination and communication. Uh, fortunately, after some initial hiccups and chaos, there was communication and centralized procurement of equipment, drugs, and consumables. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, the, the areas that, that really, really um, gave us a hard time and we really, really struggled. So I appreciated um, that detailed sharing from the first speaker because we went through a very similar kind of process, uh, struggling on our own um, with uh, the ethics committee at the hospital. And fortunately, um, that sort of converged nicely uh, with uh, what was happening at the national level. And, and even though we felt that um, a detailed scoring system might or might not work, the, the framework kind of um, established a clear understanding that if resources are scarce in relation to demand, uh, rationing is something that we would all have to do and we all have to confront uh, these difficult decisions. And that kind of uh, uh, gave um, a sense of solidarity to all the ICUs and all the hospitals that, that had to struggle uh, with uh, planning for what we call the unimaginable scenarios. So it's important because it preserves the clinician-patient relationship. It shielded the ICU doctor from deciding uh, who would come in and who would go out. And I think we had a sense that this would probably protect them from guilt and the subsequent PTSD uh, that might come from them denying care to, to people and then feeling guilty uh, forever after that. Having a system focus also ensures that there's a fair process. So we actually uh, had multiple conversations across um, the different hospitals uh, with support from uh, the various uh, ethics uh, experts so we knew that if we were doing this at Tan Tok Seng Hospital, so I know that Sui An at SGH will be doing the same thing. Yeah. Visiting policy was a big headache. Uh, no matter how much we prepared, we, we could never um, predict what was going to be decided at the government level. And so at the local level, uh, having witnessed the psychological trauma at SARS, I think, um, among the different hospitals, we, we probably really, really tried hard. So we had uh, off-site meeting rooms uh, uh, quickly set up in order to have meetings with uh, the next of kin because only one uh, visitor could come into the ICU. So, uh, and they wouldn't want to make difficult decisions by themselves without the opportunity to talk to other family members. So we had to talk to some of them in the meeting room and then we had to use uh, WhatsApp or Zoom to talk to the other family members because Singapore is, is a very close-knit uh, social family network. So people needed to, to have their say and people needed to, to participate and know what's going on. The thing that pained a lot of us was um, setting up the provision for people to say the last goodbye. And, and I think our nurses and medical social workers did, did a fantastic job because they were the ones uh, holding the phone to show the patient's face while you know the, the relatives at home or even overseas 
were were saying um, very 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 personal thing, and 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 many of them it came out, and and we kind of had to send the social worker after them to to make sure that they are fine because they had participated in such a private painful moment. The next painful thing that happened was when traveling resumed. Uh, so um, as anticipated, uh, Singaporeans rushed home from overseas to see their loved ones who were critically ill. And then it became a, a huge challenge to, to how to protect people because we had so many imported cases uh, as compared to local community spread cases. And, and we had a duty to protect the rest of the patients in, in the hospital. So eventually we sort of worked out an approval process and a very labor intensive uh, safe visit, which was fully escorted with designated routes and PPE. And we even shifted the patients to an empty ward so that there were no other patients uh, in order to support some of these uh, last goodbyes. We were fortunate that I think Singapore is quite small. Um, so in terms of the communities of healthcare workers at the different hospitals, the relationship is, is fairly good. So, so everybody kind of came together to, to get through the manpower um, struggles and the national roster for ECMO was set up. So we were quite lucky in that we had done our drill for ECMO to come to NCID because we don't have uh, an ECMO service. So it had to come from the National Heart Center or uh, National University uh, Hospital. But we were the trauma service and we were the stroke center. So again, we had to work out how we would um, look after these patients and how to deal with inter-hospital transfer of patients safely. The last part about uh, all that stuff that's going on in the ICU was organ donation. Because at the beginning of the outbreak in March, all of us said, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to have the bandwidth to deal with organ donation. But when we had the real donor in front of our eyes, uh, we, we felt that actually this was something meaningful that we couldn't um, just, just get rid of. And we're grateful that um, with a lot of communication, like I had over 100 text messages one Sunday morning, just to sort out whether this donor was good to go. Um, so it was, um, it was um, gratifying to, to know that the, these recipients are, are people at the prime of their lives who are waiting for organs. So what are the lessons learned? I think an effective public health response is critical because no amount of ICU preparation can make up for a lack of public health uh, effective measures. Uh, coordination at the national level was useful because we were so frightened that because being NCID that we would just be the hospital and we know that we would definitely be overwhelmed. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case because every hospital played their role and, and with that, I think our outcomes were, uh, are good. The third lesson was the hospital had to operate as an integrated hospital system. And for this, I think our decade of investment in the laboratory really, really paid off because at the peak of the outbreak in the ICU, we could get our PCR test results in under four hours. So that kind of allowed us to shift patients quickly out of the ICU so that we didn't have to open so many outbreak ICU beds because the serious confirmed COVID cases were already such long stayers that they were staying for about 10 to 14 days. So we became kind of like a Changi airport for, for query pneumonias where, you know, three days, uh, two swaps negative and, and, and they're out as long as they're stable enough to go across the link bridge. Um, the last lesson I would, say is, is that there's no preparation that would be enough. So, so we really needed to be prepared to scramble, uh, be prepared to be flexible and be prepared to be agile. To end, uh, I'd like to share this tremendous amount of uh, public support that we received. Uh, we've been so blessed and we've been so touched. So I'd like to thank, take this opportunity to thank the public. And with that, i uh, end my talk. Thank you, Dr. Tan, um, for the very um, heartfelt sharing and the excellent overview of the multifaceted approach in, in upskilling our resources for uh, to fight this pandemic. Um, at this juncture, maybe I would like to just show a video um, which documents our journey and a tribute to uh, our healthcare effort in fighting this pandemic.
thanks Prof Tan for providing this uh, very uh, wonderful video. And it serves as a timely reminder that, you know, um, healthcare workers has been, have been trust in the limelight and put as heroes in this fight. But we should never forget that there's a lot of um, players in this whole hospital ecosystem. And like, you know, this, this video nicely summarizes the involvement of our allied health workers, pharmacies, lab services, pottery services, environmental services, you know, security, and all this, you know, we, we are a whole hospital ecosystem and everyone are heroes in their own sense. Um, and, you know, we stand together in this worldwide fight against um, COVID and we stand in solidarity. We are only okay if everyone else is okay. So I, I think this is a very timely reminder to, you know, be kind to everyone because everyone is fighting a battle that is unseen. And, um, you know, it's a tough time for everyone. Um, I think what helps in a lot of all this pandemic preparedness is the readiness to share information across borders, the rapid dissemination of data in, in the form of published articles. And that, that sort of um, ties home the importance of ongoing educational efforts in, in this COVID fight. You know, a lot of things, life has come to a standstill, but um, education needs to go on to rapidly upskill our, our masses in, in this fight against COVID-19. And I think this is a, a very nice opportunity to lead us in into the last talk of the track um, by Prof. Chris Nixon. Um, I thought ICU education and COVID-19 uh, on challenges and responses. So, um, Prof. Nixon is an intensivist and the innovation lead for the Australian Centre of Health for Health Innovation at Alfred Health in Melbourne, as well as an adjunct clinical associate professor at Monash University. He is an internationally recognized clinician educator with a passion for helping clinicians learn um, and improve the clinical performance of uh, individuals and collectives. He is the lead for the Clinician Educator Incubator Program and is on the board of directors for the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Foundation. He has completed fellowship training in both intensive care medicine and emergency medicine, as well as postgraduate training in biochemistry, clinical toxicology, clinical epidemiology and health professional education. He was awarded the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Society's Ramesh Nagapan Education Award in 2017 and the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine's Teaching Excellence Award in 2018. He is actively involved in leading the use of trans translational simulation to improve patient care and the design of processes and systems at Alfred Health and coordinates the Alfred ICU's education and simulation programs. He is one of the founders of the FOAM movement, which stands for Free Open Access Med Medical Education and co-created Life in the Fast Lane Intensive and the SMAC Conference. So, you know, um, I was just saying that um, those who survive in the fast lane, I've managed to pass all my exams and it is a valuable resource. So without further ado, I would like to um, um, hand the airtime over to Prof. Uh, Chris Nixon. Uh, cool. I'll just do a sound check there where I while I um, get my slides up. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. And you can see your slides coming up. Okay, let me just bring them all up. Okay, um, so uh, I'll have to set, make sure I have a shorter bio next time. I think I used up most of my time. Um, but uh, uh, Thank you so much for having me. It's fantastic to be um, part of this conference. Um, as you've heard, I'm an intensive care physician and the talk that I'm gonna give on ICU education and, and uh, COVID-19 is really gonna be from that perspective that I'm in Melbourne and in Australia, I'm an intensive care physician. And um, uh, I guess I kind of, I have a systems thinking approach. So I kind of look at education in the context of a wider system and your perspectives may be different to mine due to your context. However, just having heard the previous talk, which resonated so much with, with me and my experience in Melbourne, hopefully, um, hopefully these concepts won't be too foreign for you. So it goes without saying really that COVID-19, the pandemic has posed incredible challenges to every aspect of healthcare delivery and how we live our lives day to day. And I really believe that um, our healthcare workforce really is the greatest resource we have in healthcare. But as we've heard, it is finite. 
But in order to get good patient outcomes, what we need is having highly skilled staff available who can work together in teams and in a system that creates the conditions necessary for them to take care of patients properly. And so how do we get highly skilled staff? Well, we have to train them, don't we? So that involves education. But worldwide, traditionally, health professional education has been neglected compared to other areas of, um, say, research and uh, investment in healthcare. So in 2010, globally, only 2% of healthcare expenditure was spent on health professional education, even though it is a largely talent-driven, labour-intensive industry. So when COVID-19 comes along, uh, the initial discourse, at least in Australia, was very much, do we have enough beds? Do we have enough ventilators? But really, I think the question is, do we have enough skilled staff to look after the patients who are in those beds? And the education challenges that we've had have really been posed by the pandemic because of um, the opportunity, opportunity costs we've had is we've had to decide where we put our resources into things and also the potential risks of um, transmission during education activities. So um, I'm going to break down the challenges that this pandemic has posed from an education perspective into four key areas, kind of the workload and the need for um, managing the more complex workflows and the potential for more patients and needing to expand our staff and potentially redeploy staff. Uh, that's the first one. There's also, as we've heard, just that constant, rapid, continual change in everything we do, um, information about how even to manage coronavirus uh, has been another major education challenge. And then the fact that this pandemic has come and really disrupted our usual way of, of learning, not just the content, but also how we learn and how we teach, and in particular, the impact on trainees and the pipeline from medical students through to becoming consultants. And then finally, um, a demanding job has just got a whole lot harder, not just from what's happening at work, but also for staff, what's happening at home as well. And so that has really brought staff, staff well-being to the fore. So first of all, the first challenge, this um, potential for a very high workload due to more patients, needing to change the way we do things. We've heard that everything slows down and the risk of um, staff absenteeism from illness and, um, uh, uh, and, and potentially needing to replace them with staff from other areas. So I said that I think in terms of systems. And so I wanna introduce you to this concept of the hierarchy of intervention effectiveness, which is a human factors ergonomics way of looking at things. And if you can see this diagram, you'll see that right down the bottom is education and training. And that's not that education and training isn't important, but it's compared to other interventions we can do for optimizing um, how we perform at the workplace, it's not very potent. I mean, if you think about what it takes to become an intensive care specialist, how many years of training, how much investment needs to go into that, it's a hell of a lot. So. What's better is if we can actually avoid education and training as much as possible and implement other interventions that modify the system, Things, many of the things we've already heard about, and they would include things like minimizing non-essential workloads, say by cancelling elective surgery, uh, finding new ways to standardize and simplify our workflows, introducing guidelines and checklists and cognitive aids to reduce the burden on um, clinicians so that we don't need to be, um, so that we can focus our education and training efforts elsewhere. And obviously, uh, trying to ensure, ensure that our staff are safe and well looked after so that they uh, won't be absent from the workplace. Uh, but educators actually do have a role in optimizing the system. And we've heard about the ICU launchpad idea already, which I think sounds fantastic. And that's because educators uh, especially simulation educators can, through translational simulation, enact sim systems change. So translational simulation is this idea that we can use simulation to improve systems and processes of patient care, rather than just focusing in on individual learning. 
And we really embraced this um, uh, process at the Alfred. We used these simulation sessions using frontline workers and all relevant stakeholders to really prototype and iterate new workflows. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that was that we developed new cognitive aids, including creating an emergency manual for how we uh, respond to emergencies involving COVID-19 patients. And don't worry about the details too much on, on, on this page, but what it really shows is that um, uh, we changed what we did because there'd be bedside staff who would need to respond and do stuff. And then on the outside, there'd be an emergency team assembling who often could provide advice from outside the room, sometimes without e even necessarily entering the room because we want to minimize um, pe people's exposure to the, to the virus in an emergency. Um, but one of the take homes of uh, building cognitive aids and checklists is that they really should be designed using evidence-based principles. They should be based on existing guidelines and they must be adapted to the local context. And finally, they must be integrated with training because none of these are a panacea. We need to learn how to use them correctly and, um, uh, and we need to train people to use them and uh, implement them that way. So once we've got everything else sorted out and we're still overwhelmed by this pandemic, that's when we need to look at recruiting and redeploying staff from other areas. And obviously it's a big advantage if we can use um, people who've worked in ICU or who are in um, uh, related specialties like anesthesia. So uh, one of the keys to do this is to have an appropriate orientation process. So orientating to the workplace, to the guidelines and policies that we've um, already discussed. I think boot camp courses, like everyone, many of us will know the basic course, I think is a great way of doing this. Um, but whatever we do, ideally it should have an experiential and simulation component. I think that build, helps build confidence. It helps um, also really with the team bonding and integrating people into um, authentic teams that are gonna work in, in, in the ICU. And uh, as we already heard, I think it was a great measure in, um, in Singapore to hear that uh, people were um, changing their workflows, expanding services um, prior to them actually being required. Because ideally, if you can bring staff in, allow them to shadow existing ICU staff and learn on the job in a safe way, um, they'll be much more prepared for um, the crisis when it happens. Uh, what we decided to do, though fortunately we didn't have to activate it, was to um, develop a team of team structure where intensivists would lead teams of non-ICU clinicians uh, who would be following protocols and guidelines, and then the intensivists could help them with the complex decision making um, and, uh, and provide oversight to um, the, the way those teams are operating. And that way ensure that we have ongoing ICU expertise in the right places. Another key measure of course, um, was to extend our rotations of junior staff to as long as possible so that we could avoid having to retrain up new staff. So that was our first challenge. The second challenge, and we've already heard about it, is this problem of rapid continual change and having to um, adapt our work processes. And really, at the beginning, there was so much uncertainty um, from how do we even treat COVID-19 to um, what are the appropriate infection control measures and seeing how they would change all the time. Um, so this really is a, a big, big challenge. Um, the, the sort of sort of things that I'd like to talk about in terms of how we tackled this, um, I won't mention it again, but this is probably the third time I've mentioned the importance of guidelines and protocols. I think uh, we've seen the, the power of infographics and posters to simplify messages and spread information. Um, a renewed uh, enthusiasm for the importance of team huddles in the workplace, and also the critical importance of just-in-time learning and coaching on the job. And another thing that I'd like to mention is the concept of intact teams. So first of all, I think just a, a nod to infographics and posters. And when you're suffering from information overload, I think 
having simplified messages that you can um, uh, get key information from is very useful. And um, this is an example from Albert Chan and colleagues in Hong Kong, uh, which I think uh, very much went viral in social media for um, demonstrating the principles of airway management of COVID-19 and became a very useful resource. But there's many, many other examples out there. Um, the team huddles or, or team briefings, uh, this became a real core of the way we operated at the Alfred ICU because we use these team huddles to um, uh, give people reminders about things like the PPE requirements, how we were screening for patients, um, any recent operational changes, and also what the roles and expectations of um, the people working were going to be. And if you haven't got a well-defined process for this yet, um, I suggest just having a look um, at the circle up method by uh, uh, Rock, Laura Rock and colleagues from Harvard CMS. Um, they have a, a whole structure for how to do um, briefings and huddles. It also involves the micro check-ins during the day and importantly, a debriefing huddle at the end of the day so that we can learn from our experiences and check in that everyone is okay. Um, another thing that's already been highlighted is this key role of the PPE monitor, um, the personal protective equipment monitor. And, and I'm highlighting, highlighting this because I think calling them a monitor really does a disservice to the role. They've had a key role, I think, in um, uh, being a repository of the, of, of the current ways of doing things in terms of infection control, being able to teach and remind people about the, the requirements for PPE, and then actually coaching people through the processes in a just-in-time fashion, which has been really critical during this pandemic. There's, uh, I mean, I know my experience, I'll learn something once, and if I don't use it over and over in a short time afterwards, it pretty much evaporates. So for me, this uh, concept of just-in-time learning is absolutely critical. Um, most of healthcare operates in terms of ad hoc teams. And so what do I mean by an ad hoc team? I mean, that means that when something needs to be done, we look around and see who's available, and then we form a team on the fly to deal with that problem. Um, but we've seen that during the pandemic, some centres have had um, intact teams to provide intubation. So they've had defined personnel and defined roles for that process. We didn't find we needed, we felt, we didn't feel like we needed to do that for intubation at the Alfred. But for percutaneous tracheostomy, where we had to kind of use simulation to build up a whole new process of doing it to minimise um, exposure to aerosols, we found that having a core group of people to use simulation to develop that process, but then train in it over and over, meant that we could uh, feel comfortable that we were going to achieve a high standard of performance, um, uh, even though this was going to be a procedure that we only performed about half a dozen times. So the third challenge I'd like to talk about is just how the pandemic has really disrupted usual education practice and how it's affected the training pipeline from medical student through to a consultant. Well, when I look at how we run our education program at the Alfred ICU, it, it, it really is quite explicitly two-pronged. So I think, you know, most important, what's, what is health professional education about, it should be improving patient care. And so what we provide is really targeted at looking after the patients in our ICU. And so that involves, we're an ECMO center, so that will involve ECMO training, for instance. Um, but we also have a big responsibility to our trainees and the public in general to actually prepare our trainees appropriately for passing their college exams, moving through the training process and becoming highly trained intensivists at the end of it. And um, so we have sessions dedicated to both of these and uh, because we really couldn't do face-to-face -face teaching in large numbers the same way that we could, there's been an obvious transition to remote learning just like we're doing now with this conference. If I focus more on that patient care focused education, what we found was that certainly in the first couple of months, um, 
the the focus really was in understanding how to manage coronavirus and how to adapt to the new workflows. But gradually, we need to start reintroducing how we look after everything else, all the other conditions that uh, both coronavirus and non-coronavirus patients have. And um, because that just simply is an opportunity cost. Uh, we only have so much to, time to teach and there's a lot of stuff to learn. Uh, the ro remote learning has been an incredible success from our point of view because we've always had that challenge of uh, people working shifts. How do we get them in one place? Um, and it's something that we really should have done earlier, which is um, open up opportunities to be able to learn from their living rooms. And um, it worked quite well for us because we'd inst instituted a new way of sort of teaching called inquiry-based learning, where we would have a question of the day that would be discussed on the ward round. And then at the end of the week, all the questions would be brought to one discussion forum where we'd share what we'd learned um, uh, and um, sum it all up uh, in one teaching session. And so that's worked very well uh, remotely. Um, one of our concerns was how do we do simulation if um, we're only allowed so many people in a room, um, we're going to be in close contact, could we put each other at risk? But what we found is that we can do it safely using appropriate PPE, so long as we're um, using this resource for an important um, uh, reason and training, um, although often neglected, as we've discussed, really is important for patient care. So I think if you have well-ventilated rooms, restrict the numbers um, and a, a careful cleanup process, telesimulation can be done, done really well with remote learners using things like Zoom. Uh, however, you do have to modify your um, debrief process to ensure psychological safety for everyone involved. And then I guess the other thing that happened, and again, why didn't that happen sooner, was that we had increased collaboration at a well, in, in Australia and New Zealand level, um, through the college, uh, remote learning, monthly teaching sessions, as well as exam prep sessions. And I just wanna, I don't have, it's, it's beyond the scope of this talk to talk about how to really use Zoom effectively for teaching and learning, but this is a fantastic resource on the Harvard Macy Institute um, community blog by um, Alyssa Hall on harnessing the power of Zoom for teaching and learning. Uh, if you do this stuff, I highly recommend um, checking out that resource as a webinar, as well as a whole lot of um, other resources so that you can um, uh, make the most of all the different features of Zoom and also other applications that you in can integrate with Zoom to make it um, a really great learning experience. Um, before moving on to the fourth challenge, coronavirus has had a big impact on the trainee pipeline. So medical students in particular have been hit really hard. Um, uh, in our setting, for a large part of it, they've been excluded from clinical care areas, uh, such as the ICU, where there's a, a perceived higher risk of coronavirus transmission. And that makes it really hard to um, be exposed to clinical mentors who are sharing the way they think about conditions, as well as how do you learn clinical examination if you're not allowed to touch a patient. And similarly, uh, there's been a similar challenge with developing procedural skills. Um, and same with our postgraduate trainees who are trying to become fellows of the college. They've experienced similar difficulties with um, trying to develop their, their clinical and procedural skills. They've, um, these high stakes examinations are extremely stressful at the best of times. And then when you don't even know when they can occur, the format's gonna change. It may be online, who knows which city it will be, how will it work? Um, it's been incredibly stressful and tough for those people. So um, we, we've done our best to support them, and I know the college has as well in Australia and New Zealand, um, but uh, yeah, it really just this pandemic has not been fair on those people. And that's a nice segue really to the fourth challenge, which is really that um, this pandemic has been an incredible threat to staff well-being. 
Um, and why is that? Well, as we've already heard, the stress of just the constant change, trying to stay up to date um, is really tough. When we're wearing PPE, we're, when we're in isolation, there's the communication difficulties, the fatigue and physical discomfort, which means that we're more likely to have friction between people and just feel exhausted. Um, there's fears about personal safety, the health of our colleagues, our friends and our family, and many of the usual strategies that we have for um, coping with stress, our recreational activities, being able to socialize, um, have all been turned upside down. And certainly in our setting, we've had a number of people who are from overseas and they don't even know when they can see their families again, and they don't know when they'll be able to get a, a job or progress to becoming a consultant. So staff wellbeing has been a big issue. And if I go back to this hierarchy of intervention effectiveness, and we already heard from the preceding talk that um, the systems measures for improving uh, staff wellbeing are absolutely critical from ensuring we have enough staff with the right skills rostered in a, in a effective way. The tea room has already been highlighted as a critical component of staff wellbeing, um, but is also a high risk area for transmission. Um, ensuring people can actually just get access to food and rest and then outside of the workplace exercise is tricky. Making sure we have adequate supplies of PPE and a safe environment for people to work in and also access to psychological support. So at the Alfred, we have an employee assistance program that can be contacted 24-7. Uh, but the other thing that's been highlighted is that um, self-care and well-being is a neglected but now I think essential component of ICU education and it's something that we have to do better at. And the ways that we've kind of tried to tackle that during the pandemic has been to have frequent updates and staff forums, uh, which are partly just venues to share and vent and I think have been really important, uh, but also looking at ways to actually teach self-care and thinking about role modeling because it's very important as intensivists that we uh, don't try and appear to be superheroes that are just rolling with the punches, that it is actually okay to be not okay, share our struggles and the strategies that we're using to overcome these things. Um, so in terms of providing those updates, I think a useful way to do it is the CDC's method, which is always be providing up to the minute information, always acknowledge the uncertainty and demonstrate concern. So empathize with the emotional strain and stress that people are experiencing, but reassure people that there is a, a team of people uh, that's working really hard on behalf of everyone to make things better. And so we've incorporated at least a component of that almost into every teaching session that we do at the Alfred. If you're looking for a resource on how to um, teach um, self-care or just having resources for personal learning. Um, one of the most useful ones I've found is this rapem.org uh, project, which is the uh, wellness, resilience and performance in emergency medicine project out of Queensland. But it's uh, totally applicable to the ICU environment and I highly recommend it. So I'd like to finish now with um, just a couple of key take homes about um, I guess what, what I've learned through the COVID-19 interface with education and just want to reiterate just that our, you know, our workforce is our greatest resource. So we do need to invest in training and more importantly, create conditions in which they can thrive. And that now in particular, self-care and well-being needs to be a key component of ICU education. Um, that it's actually, it's not your title or position that matters, it's skill sets and the collective competence of the entire team that matters. And so whether that's achieved by nursing staff, um, whether that's achieved by non-ICU clinicians, it doesn't matter so long as we have a system that works um, and, um, and that we can take care of patients well. Uh, as with everything in this pandemic, we found that necessity breeds innovation and that um, crisis, crisis brings adaptation. And uh, I think the silver lining is that many of the innovations we've seen, 
such as our capacity to provide remote learning will probably last long after the pandemic. However, innovations that we do bring in need to be appropriately tested um, uh, before being fully implemented. And finally, um, uh, hopefully I've emphasized this enough that education is important, but it needs to be part of a wider systems perspective, integrated with design, human factors, and ergonomics. And whatever solutions we come up with are going to be context specific. And I've shared with you some of my insights and observations from my setting. Things that work in your environment may be different, but I think we can always learn from each other. So thank you very much for having me and for listening in. Thank you, Prof Nixon, for the very uh, informative sharing. Um, I really wish we had more time to uh, engage uh, all three of our very esteemed speakers um, for this track, but unfortunately, you know, time has caught up with us. Um, so really, join me in thanking all of our three speakers, uh, Dr. Nicholas Sadovnikov, Prof Tan Hui Ling, and uh, Prof Nixon and Chris. Um, thank you once again for, for all the wonderful tips and uh, insightful um, sharing heartfelt um, experiences. Um, you know, before I end off this track, I really would um, like to send my well wishes to everyone tune in, uh, wherever you may be in this part of the world. Uh, we are in this together and, you know, stay strong, stay well, be kind. And with that, I would like to end off this track. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye.